uh, BIOS, CMOS, UFI, and the boot process. So BIOS, what is BIOS? It stands for your basic input output system. Uh, BIOS is the firmware, it's software on a chip, and it's the most common firmware that we have in the computer. It is the first software that's run by the computer when you boot it up. When you turn on the computer, the first thing it does is to test and initialize the processor, it tests the RAM, it tests your video card, uh, it's going to check your disk drives and your adapters. This BIOS is stored in the ROM chip. ROM stands for read-only memory. Okay? Um, and the settings are actually stored in what's called CMOS. And CMOS is a type of memory that's more of a permanent storage. What do we use BIOS for? Uh, we use it to configure all sorts of things in the computer. We can configure the boot order, the storage devices. Uh, should we be booting from the USB drive first or the hard drive first? Or the floppy drives or the optical drives? Um, we can configure built-in ports like our PS2 ports and our serial ports and our USB and our SATA if we want them on or off and disabled. Um, we have AGP, PCI, and PCIe slots. We can configure their speeds and settings for it. We have integrated chipsets. If you have an integrated video card, for instance, but you wanted to put in a nice gaming graphics card, you might want to turn off the onboard video card and you do that through the BIOS. It'll support whether or not you're going to allow virtualization to happen using VT technology inside the processor. Uh, it's going to allow you to do the clock speed of the CPU where you can overclock your system if you want to. Uh, it, you can configure your memory, you can do your power management, a whole bunch of security settings. Uh, it also has PC health like the temperatures the, and the uh, fan speeds. Um, and it also on the newer BIOSes, the UFI BIOSes, they actually can give you direct access to the internet without ever being connected through your actual booting of your computer. Um, for instance, the machines we have here they actually have some games and they have web access through the BIOS, which is kind of strange, uh, but they allow it. Uh, and it's useful because if you don't have an operating system already installed and you need to look something up, you could do that. Now, of course, you can also pull out your iPhone and do that, but it does give you that capability. Um, so the BIOS and the boot process. So the first thing that happens when you turn on the computer is the computer powers on. The BIOS then performs a power on self-test where it goes through and tests that processor and the RAM and the video card and make sure that things are working. It's going to read the settings from the CMOS, which is its storage, and it's going to look for an operating system on the hard drive or the CD to boot from. The BIOS is going to tell the computer how to do its most basic functions. How does it take input from the keyboard? How does it output to your monitor? How does it make sounds to the speaker? All of these things are handled at the BIOS level so that the people like Windows and Microsoft who make Windows don't have to code that into their operating system because it's already done. Okay? Um, and it lets any operating system use these basic functions. It's a very low-level uh, operating system of sorts. CMOS, the Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. That's probably the only time you'll ever see it written out that way. You probably will not remember what it stands for, but just remember CMOS is the memory for BIOS. Okay? Um, CMOS is non-volatile memory, which means when you take away power, those settings remain. It's one of the reasons why we have that battery on the board there. It maintains the power to the CMOS. Um, it is built into your motherboard. It's a chip that is soldered on. And the memory is retained as long as it, reta as long as it keeps getting uh, direct current power from the battery that's on the motherboard. And when we took apart the computer, you guys were able to see that battery and where you'd replace it. On this picture, you can see the batteries being held by that clip. Uh, the CMOS battery, they generally last about three years. Uh, typically, they're an older uh, CR2032 battery uh, is used in current systems. Some older systems actually use this ES12887 Alpha. Don't worry about that. It basically uh, looked like a big square block on the motherboard. Um, and then some older ones even used like double A-sized um, batteries on there as well called Eternal Cells. Um, if the battery starts failing, you're going to see that the system clock keeps losing time. So if you turn on your computer and today it's 12.38, you turn it on tomorrow at 12.38 and it says it's 2.38, then you know you have a problem uh, where it's losing time or dates. Um, and the battery needs to be replaced. Those batteries are really cheap, less than five bucks. You can get a two-pack at pretty much any um, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, etc., and pop one in. They're real easy to replace as well. So again, they last about three years and the CMOS battery does keep those settings. So if you keep losing settings and losing time, uh, the CMOS battery is going dead on you. So how do you configure your system BIOS? Well, first you have to get into the BIOS setup. Uh, you press any valid key combination that's set by the manufacturer. Usually it's either F2 or delete depending on your manufacturer. Um, on this particular one here that I'm showing you, it's F2. 
but it could be either. It just depends on your model and who you who you have. Um, I've seen some that use escape as well. Usually when you boot up the computer, it will tell you on the screen. If it doesn't, go to the manufacturer's website or Google, you know, what key does Acer use, and it'll tell you what key they use. But usually F2 or delete will get you there. Once you get in there, you have two types of BIOS that you might see. One is the old traditional BIOS, which is a text-based system. Uh, those look a lot like what I have here on the screen. With these, your mouse doesn't even work. It's all about your keyboard. So up and down keys, uh, page up, page down keys, enter and spacebar make all your changes. Uh, it allows you to view the information on your RAM, your CPU, your optical drives, your hard drives, and configure all these different configurations as needed uh, for the BIOS. The UFI, which is the Unified Extensible Firmware Initiative, is the newest version of BIOS. Um, if you have a nice Asus like this one, this looks a lot like the machines we use. Uh, they're a graphical display. You can use your mouse and point and click. Um, they have software in them like web surfing ability, games, and backup programs. And again, it still lets you do all that same configuration. Nothing different um, except for the fact that it looks prettier. Okay? Some people like this. Some people like the old version better. I grew up with the text base, so I'm kind of used to it. Um, but these are, have a lot of nice features as well. And we'll play with this in the class. Some BIOS give you the ability of doing what's called auto configuration. Uh, auto configuration is not always going to be your optimal configuration, but it's just kind of the best guess the computer can have. So it'll have either the BIOS defaults, which are kind of the original or fail safe. Uh, they'll have setup defaults, which are, you know, they call it optimal, even though they're really not. Uh, and they have turbo, which is just a really fast configuration. Um, these can be useful during troubleshooting. If you're having some problems, you can go back to this fail safe environment. But in general, it's not going to be the best setup for your particular computer for either a security or an operational perspective, so it's better for you to configure your BIOS yourself. When you turn on the, the, uh, the computer, the first thing it does is the power on self-test. Okay? It does the initial test performed by the BIOS, and it finds error in your hardware and it reports it. Uh, this is going to do some basic checks on your CPU, your processor, and different parts of the BIOS. It's going to check your system time, your video display, memory, the keyboard, and the disk drives. Uh, once it does that, it's going to report that. And there's two different ways that it can report it. Uh, it can, or three different ways, excuse me. It can do what's called a beep code, where basically you'll hear the speaker make some beeps. Like, for instance, if it went beep, 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 that would be 312. And if I look at my chart, under 312, it is the master DMA register failed. Okay? Um, and then you can Google that and figure out what that means and how you're going to fix it, right? Which in this case is part of the motherboard, which means time to buy a new motherboard, right? Um, so these are the kind of things you can look at. Uh, there is no standard beep codes. It's all based on your manufacturer. So if you're troubleshooting somebody's machine, you've got to check their beep codes for their manufacturer. The other way, uh, if it got at least as far as the video display card, then it can display those errors to the screen. And it'll actually just put it in text, error code, you know, 38, memory bad, or something like that. And the third way is it can use what's called a post error code, which are written in hexadecimal format. And you can actually use a postcard, which is what this is, POST, Power on Self-Test Card, you install it into the machine into one of your PCI X slots, and on this LCD readout, it will give you an error in hexadecimal format. So it may say 3-alpha-2-charlie, which is 3-a-2-c, and you'd look that up in that manufacturer's postcode, and it would say that means that the video card is bad, and that way you would know. So three different ways to test it. The most common is obviously the beep codes and the error, uh, error on the screen, but you could use all three. So BIOS security. Inside BIOS, we do have some security things we can do. We can set passwords. We can have a boot password. So when you turn on the computer, the first thing it goes is, what's your password? And if you don't give the password, it'll just sit there and, or shut down. Uh, you can have a BIOS password, which protects your BIOS from being changed by somebody who's not you. It's kind of like an administrator account access, right? The third way you can do it is you can have a hard drive password. And if you have a hard drive password, what ends up what ends up happening is when you turn on the computer, it will boot, and as soon as it tries to load the hard drive, it'll ask for the password, and if you don't give it, it won't boot up from that hard drive. So you could still boot from a CD, you just wouldn't be able to boot from the hard drive in that case. So lots of different ways to do the security. Um, this is an example of a security screen from a uh, Dell machine. Uh, it has an admin password, which is the BIOS password, the system password, which is the boot password, and then the drive passwords uh, for the different hard drives that it has. You also, some of these will actually do drive encryption through the BIOS, where it scrambles the data on the hard drive and only unscrambles it with the proper password. That way, if you lose your laptop, somebody who picks up in the parking lot can't read your documents. 
Uh, trusted Platform Module can be turned on from here as well. Trusted Platform Module, we'll talk about more when we get to Windows later on, um, but it's used by things like BitLocker to do encryption of the hard drive and for security in Windows. It's a piece inside your processor in the newer processors that adds a security key. Uh, some of them will actually have CompuTrace or LoJack, and what that is is if your computer gets lost or stolen, it will actually beacon out over the internet to say, hey, I'm located here, come get me. Okay, uh, Kind of like LoJack for a car back in the day. And then the last thing is they have Secure Boot, which will actually do a secure boot up process as well. Just some different settings that we can do for biosecurity. And when we get into security, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Another thing your BIOS can do is it can do monitoring. So here's another example of an EFI BIOS. This one is that Asus uh, that I was dealing with before. And you can see it's got these little, uh, almost like speed dials, where it's telling us how much energy is being used. Uh, it's telling us the voltage of the CPU. It's telling us the fan speed. It'll tell us the temperature and the cooling. Uh, it'll tell us whether or not intrusion detection is if somebody has opened your case. So earlier we went into, your, into the CPUs or the uh, computers and we opened the case, right? And we took out something. So you can have the setup in BIOS, it'll actually detect that that happened. And next time you turn on the computer, it'll go beep, 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 intrusion detected. And that just tells you as a person that somebody has gone in there and they may have taken your hard drive, they may have taken your memory or put something else in there, right? Because it opened your case. Uh, you can also set your clock and your bus speed inside of there as well and see what's going on. For instance, we can see up here the processor is 3400 megahertz or 3.4 gigahertz uh, is being operated there. And BIOS updates. So in the old days when we wanted to change out our BIOS, we actually would take a chip off of the board and put a new chip in. And that was how we would change out the BIOS. Um, your BIOS needs to be upgraded if you're going to make major issues. If you have something like power management issues because you got a brand new computer that they just made and they coded it wrong, they might have an error in the BIOS and you'll have to upgrade that. Um, or if the processor was changed out, you put in a new processor and it has new capabilities, the BIOS has to be upgraded to support that as well. Uh, if you check your manufacturer's website, they'll tell you what the latest version is and whether or not you need a new BIOS. In the modern systems though, all we do is we flash it. So it's just a software upgrade to the BIOS. Because again, it's software on a chip, right? We don't have to replace the chip, we just have to replace the code. And so when we do that flash, like we're doing here on the screen, it's going to overwrite the BIOS, and your BIOS will now have the new, the new code and any new features that are given. Um, before you do this, you always want to back it up, because if something goes wrong, you can do what's called bricking your computer, where basically it won't turn on anymore. Because if it doesn't have BIOS that works, the computer won't even boot. Okay? So you got to make sure you do a good backup first. Usually if that happens, you'll have to reflash the BIOS again. So, where is the only place where the initial boot settings can be configured? This is one that always trips students up. Is it the CMOS, the BIOS, the MBR, or the HAL? Um, so, CMOS, we said, was what? That's the thing with the battery. Thing with the battery that stores the settings. What is the BIOS? Basic input-output system, right? And it does all the configurations, right? So that's the right answer. Uh, MBR, we haven't talked about that yet, it's the master boot record. It's the piece on your hard drive that tells where all the files are and what gets booted from it. Uh, and then HAL is from, Mystery Sci uh, is from uh, Space Odyssey 2001, right? Um, so that is not the right answer either. This was a real test question. I did not make this up. HAL was really on the test. So, but again, if I just throw up four acronyms, somebody might guess it, right? So a lot of times that's what they'll do. So that's why knowing your acronyms is important. But yeah, in this case, it's BIOS. BIOS does the configuration. CMOS does the storage. Okay? And that is our BIOS, CMOS, UFI, and the boot process.